Praise the Lord, everybody. Pastor Fields here. I thank God for another day, another opportunity, of course, always to come together with the people of God. This is Wednesday, and we are preparing to go into our Bible study for this week. I thank God for all of you, all of the saints of God here at Greater Refuge Temple in Washington, D.C., Refuge Temple Lennox in the Bronx, and Jeremiah Temple there in Baltimore, Maryland. I thank God for all of the saints of God, all of the saints everywhere who tie in with us every week, uh, up and down the East Coast, all over this country, and different parts of the world. I thank God for you, weekly, joining with us uh, in Bible study. And some of you catch us, of course, on the replay. I thank God for you also. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we, before we go into the Word of God. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your manifold blessings, all that you do for us, all that you are to us. We thank you. We give your name the glory and the honor. Bless us, Father, through your Word. Bless us tonight, everyone that touches us on tonight, who connects with us on tonight. Let your blessings flow richly. Touch our hearts and minds, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. I'm excited about the lesson on tonight. We are in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and we're in chapter 2. And the very first verse will be, our concentration will be in the first verse, second chapter of the book of Hebrews. Yes, and it sounds like this. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Powerful verse, powerful scripture there. And um, I want to use as a subject of our lesson tonight, take heed, take heed. Uh, certainly when you hear those words, take heed, you think of warnings or caution or uh, pay attention, listen to me. Uh, I don't want you to miss this. All of these uh, words, or phrases come to mind when you hear the words, take heed. And of course, uh, the book of Hebrews, the author uh, is debatable. Some say Paul, most say it's not Paul. So the writer is really anonymous, but um, written, geared towards Jewish Christians, those Jews who had um, left Judaism to go into Christianity. They had been converted into Christianity and they were going through a very high level of persecution. And um, some, perhaps not many of them, were feeling as though they should have stayed in Judaism uh, because of all of the troubles they were having. So the writer um, writes some very powerful words. And the key words in this epistle, um, the book of Hebrews, which was written to these Jewish believers, born again believers, filled with the Holy Ghost. There are key words in this epistle, better or superior, better or superior. I'll take you to Hebrews 1 and 4, where it says, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath inheritance, I'm sorry, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent way than they. They were arguing the point, it was better for us to stay where we were. It was better for us to stay under the law. It was better for us not to come into this salvation, this way of living. Uh, so the writer keeps writing about how things are better, how things are more superior. What they have now is much better than what they had before. Hebrews 6 and nine, it says, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, 
though we thus speak. We are persuaded better things of you, my Lord, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Again, he, he talks this language in the seventh chapter of Hebrews, verse number 19, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, my Lord, by the which we draw nigh unto God. He says we have a better life. We have a better hope. Hallelujah. My God, I'm feeling this already. Hebrews 7 and 22. The writer of Hebrews writes these words. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Yes, a better way, a better testament. Hebrews 8 and 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is, he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. So all through the book, you hear better, superior, more excellent. Hebrews 10 and 34, he writes again, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. My Lord, I'm on a roll, but he hits it again. Hebrews 11 and 16, he says, but now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared them for a city. If I stay in the 11th chapter of Hebrews and go down to verse 35, where he's talking about faith, but he says, women receive their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, but that they might obtain a better resurrection. Everything now is better. Hallelujah. What God has done for us, what he has supplied for us, what he has provided for us, everything is better. No matter what you're going through, what God has given you is much better than what you had before. Hebrews 11 and 40, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. God provided some better thing for us. And Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So the writer of Hebrews is telling us it's better now. It's very much better to be a born-again believer. A Christian, hallelujah, then for us not to be one. Why? Well, for a surety, God has so many better things for his people, better things in store for his people. But in the midst of all of the things that I've stated and the fact that the writer of Hebrews is discussing that what we have is much better now, there are so many who are constantly in danger. Um, and I, I, well, I'll just say it. There are so many who are in danger of backsliding or missing out on their reward. How those things that God has promised them uh, because they won't follow on to know him. Yes, I mean to know Christ, to follow on, to push forward. Uh, the mothers, when I was growing up, would, would always say constantly there are higher heights and deeper depths in the Lord. So I don't want to lose out on what God has for me. And of course, I don't want to lose out on this, this fullness of salvation. I don't want to lose what God has provided or given unto me. And uh, these things happen when the people of God become neglectful or uh, careless with their salvation. Mm -hmm. 
or they fail to progress uh, into all that God has planned, purposed, and provided. God has planned, purposed, hallelujah, and provided. I want all that God has planned, purposed, and provided for me. Put that in the comment section, won't you? Make that proclamation. I want all that God has planned, purposed, and provided for me. I love that. I feel it in my spirit. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you time to put that in there. Make that proclamation. I want all, everything. Yes, every bit of it. Whatever God has planned, purposed, or provided for me. Because I'm his child. And he has things in store for me. And I'm not just talking about dying and going to heaven. There are things that God has planned for me, purposed for me, hallelujah, and provided for me in this lifetime. And I want all of that. Yes, and I want heaven too, hallelujah. Hence, we receive an exhortation in chapter 6 of the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse number 1. Listen to what the writer says. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of the repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. He's saying move forward, move past how you were baptized. Yes, baptized in Jesus' name. Yes, speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives. Yes, all of that is wonderful. I thank God. But Paul is saying it's time to dig deeper, go further. What has God planned for you? What has he purposed in your life? And what has he provided? Hallelujah. Time to grow in. Hallelujah. I'm not just going to say grow up, but grow in. Grow in God. Hebrews 6 and 1. Here is the challenge, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. There's a problem if all you can do is say how you were baptized, who your pastor is, what church you go to, uh, how have you grown, what is the depth? Yes, God has been good to you. How have we matured? Hallelujah. What about spiritual maturity? Now, um, I believe that the Bible teaches us that anyone who was truly saved, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, and living holy, the best that they can, God, and yes, even the holiest of us, because we're human, there are times when we don't get everything right, and we may not think the right thoughts all the time. Yes, but I believe that there is an eternal security, a, a, a fastening, if you please. And I, I'm, I'm going to give you about seven reasons why I feel that way. doesn't mean that it's impossible for a person to backslide. I don't want you to feel that I'm saying that, but it is possible if I'm living all that I know to live and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide me, that I can receive everything that God has planned, purposed, and provided for me. Hallelujah. And it's locked in because I'm his and he is mine. And I'm going to give you seven reasons why I say that. Number one, because of divine election. Hallelujah. The Lord chose you. The Lord chose me. Yes, before the foundation of the world, Romans 8, 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. He says in Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him 
in love. This is Paul talking some good stuff. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. Paul again writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul writes to Timothy on one occasion in chapter 1, verse number 9, and he says these words, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose mm -hmm, and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus when, he says, before the world began. It was already provided, and I want all of it. First Peter 1 and 2, this is the Apostle Peter's talking. He says, elect according to the full knowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So the first reason I say this, if I'm living holy, if I'm holding on, to the truth of God's word and allowing the Holy Spirit to walk and live freely in my life, I can have everything God has planned, purposed, and provided. And the first reason why, and I'm giving you scripture, is because of divine election. He knew he was going to save me before I was even born. Number two is because of the completeness of his work of redemption. He's not a half-do God. Hallelujah. No. He finishes everything that he starts. So it's because of the completeness of Christ's redemptive work. I'll take you back to Hebrews. I'm going to be giving a lot of scriptures tonight. So flow with me. Hebrews 1 and 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself, my God, no one else did it, by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on the high. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. No one else did it. He did it himself, and he did an excellent job washing our sins away. I'll give you another scripture. We're back in Hebrews. We're, we're going to stay in Hebrews for this one. Hebrews 7 and 25. Hebrews 7 and 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. My Lord. So, Again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14, he says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Don't have to make any more sacrifices after Jesus. No, he was a complete final sacrifice. And the blood still works. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering. Oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And all those sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. My Lord, we still needed more sacrifices. Hallelujah. But Jesus... When Jesus came, he washed thoroughly our sins away. Hallelujah. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he hath offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sacrificed sanctified. I'm sorry, my Lord. No one else can do it. No one else could have handled it. Jesus did a complete work of redemption. The third reason 
Hallelujah. Because salvation is of grace. Hallelujah. He gave it to me. Salvation. He gave it to me. Hallelujah. He gave it to me. My God. I didn't deserve it, but he gave it to me. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. Put that in the comment section. Hallelujah. Salvation. God gave it to me because of the, hallelujah, salvation is of grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. He gave it to me. Not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul writes in Philippians, hallelujah, in this vein, talking about uh, the salvation is of grace. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. My Lord, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. This salvation was not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So this is why I believe that, hallelujah, those of us who are truly saved and living holy, we have this eternity thing locked in. All I've got to do is endure as a good soldier. And he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Hallelujah. So I said this because of divine election. I said this because of the completeness of God's redemptive work. And I've said this because salvation is of grace. The fourth reason why I said that is because of the eternal nature of salvation. The eternal nature of salvation. Here we go. Hallelujah. Everybody knows this scripture. For God so loved the world. John 3.16 he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy 4, 18. Paul writes to us and says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. This is the eternal nature, hallelujah, of salvation. And I'm going to take you to Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once, hallelujah, hallelujah, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So you need to make sure you're locked in. Hallelujah. Don't play with your salvation. Ha ha shamaye. Glory. You better make sure you're locked in. We want to see Jesus. Salvation. Hallelujah. The nature of salvation is eternal. Don't cut yourself off. Don't walk away. Hold on until the end. Well, the fifth reason is because of the clear promises that are found in the word of God. The clear promises of scripture. John, St. John 5 and 24. This is Jesus talking. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him, that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's Jesus talking. Jesus says it again, John 6 and 37, John 6 and 37, this is Jesus talking, all that the Father gives me shall come to me. Everything the Father 
hallelujah, giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Everything the Father has for me will come to me. My Lord. John 10, 28 and 29. John 10, 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Mm. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Hallelujah. Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this one very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day, hallelujah, of Jesus Christ. These are promises found in his word, and God keeps his promises. The sixth reason is because of the believer's union he or she has with Jesus Christ. Yes, you're united with him. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, But as many as received him, to them gave he power, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. St. John 15 and 5. This is Jesus talking. I am the vine. He are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, ye can do nothing. Hallelujah. Got to stay connected. Got to stay in union with him. Don't walk away from Jesus. We're too close now. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 6, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're connected with him. We're sitting in heavenly places with him. In Colossians 1 and 13, Paul writes, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And the seventh reason why I made that statement, the fact that those who are truly filled with the Holy Ghost, born again, they are locked into an eternal security. And again, it doesn't mean that, hallelujah, they cannot willfully walk away or backslide. But if they endure, if we hold on to this salvation, we can have everything that God has planned purposed and provided for us. Hallelujah. The seventh reason why I say that is because of the work of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The works of the Holy Ghost are eternal. Ephesians chapter 1, I'll read verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. Powerful. Powerful. Now, um, and, and some may disagree with this uh, statement, but if we hold on to our salvation, if we hold on to the Holy Ghost, don't, don't sway with the world. Hallelujah. Again, we'll have everything God has planned, purposed, and provided for us. Hallelujah. And his reason for saving us was so that we can be with him. So if we're holding on tightly, I don't believe a person can be lost if they're holding on to the things of God. Hallelujah. But if 
that man or woman is careless and neglectful, uh, if, if they begin to shut down and, and push away from the things of God, hallelujah, uh, that connection can get weak. You're even in danger of being disconnected. He says, if I am in him and he's in me, I can ask the Father anything, but so there has to be a connection, a consistent connection. Hallelujah. So in connection with what I just said, the writer of Hebrews also gives us warnings. In other words, take heed. <laughs> I know you go to church every Sunday, you speak in tongues and you're you're singing in the choir and you're doing all of this and doing all of that, but he gives us also seven warnings. Hallelujah. Letting us know that if we become careless, if we move into a place of disobedience, hallelujah, then there's no way that we can grow and mature the way that God would have us to. Yes, if we become negligent, careless, or disobedient, my God, how can you grow? How can you get to know the more of God? How can you grow strong? How can you go higher? How can you go deeper? So there are two things that will happen. Uh, hallelujah. You'll incur the discipline of God. Yes, because he loves us. He disciplines us. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. And yes, the Lord can spank us. We always quote that scripture, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. But that's not the entire verse. He says, for his anger endures, but for a moment. Yes, David was being chastised for something. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verses 6 through 11. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? My goodness. Verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, <laughs> but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hallelujah. Let's compare that to what John writes in his gospel, John 15 and 2, where he says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Hallelujah. My God. First Corinthians, the 11th chapter. First Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 28, and I'll read verses 28 through 32 where it says, but let a man examine himself. Yes, we read this all the time before communion. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Hallelujah. For this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, 
We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So we'll incur the chastisement of God or we can, we can lose that individual who has become careless and disobedient and neglecting the things of God, neglecting their salvation. Hallelujah. You are in danger of losing your reward. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians. Listen to what Paul says. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Hallelujah. If your work, if what you've been doing, hallelujah, and it's been built on a good foundation and God judges your works, hallelujah. And he sees that it's a good work, you will receive a reward. But listen, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Yeah, so all of this stuff people are doing, God knows, hallelujah, and our works are going to be tried, hallelujah, and there are some who are in danger of losing their reward because of neglect, because of disobedience, because of carelessness. So here the writer of Hebrews is warning the saints. Hallelujah. He's not all, he's not just talking about this salvation that we have and the fact that it's better now. Hallelujah. A better way, a better covenant, a better sacrifice. Uh, but he deals now with the discipline there is a discipline that comes with this salvation, a maturity that should be happening. Hallelujah. And there is danger here if we become careless, neglectful. Hallelujah. And he raises a question, an, etern an internal questioning, hallelujah, concerning receiving all that God has planned, mm -hmm, purposed, and provided for us as his children. So here are the dangers, hallelujah, that he is warning, and this is why we named the lesson, take heed, pay attention, hallelujah, be alert, be watchful, hallelujah, be consistent, ha, be faithful to this God who died and rose again for your sins. Number one, there's a danger of drifting like a ship without a rudder. Hebrews, we're in Hebrews, the second chapter. This is our anchor scripture. The first three verses, he says, if we become careless and neglectful and disobedient, hallelujah, we are in danger of drifting like a ship without a rudder. Chapter two of Hebrews, verses one, two, and three. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Hallelujah. So I don't want to be a drifter. <laughs> I want to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I don't want to be drifting. I want to be in Christ and he in me. My Lord. We're in danger, and this picture of a ship that has drifted past its moorings, or 
Hallelujah. And this is our danger. Verse 3 tells us how we drift. Let's read verse 3 again. Hebrews 2 and 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hallelujah. So it's, it's a neglect of prayer, reading the Bible. It's a neglect even of soul winning and so on and so on. And one reason for this is that we become preoccupied with secondary and unimportant things. Preoccupied. We've lost our focus. Don't lose your focus. Hallelujah. Don't lose your focus. And unimportant things now have taken, hallelujah, the limelight in our lives. And we don't spend as, as much time with the Lord as we used to. And because of this, some are in danger of drifting like a ship without a rudder. The second danger we discover that the writer of Hebrews is warning us something we should take heed, the danger of having an evil heart of unbelief. And notice my terminology, the danger of having an evil heart of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, I'll read verses 12 through 19, Hebrews chapter 3. Verses 12 through 19. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, departing from the living God. Hallelujah. But exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. Hallelujah. We are made partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence. If you hold on, don't let go. Don't change anything. Don't walk away. Hold on. Hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation for someone they had heard did provoke, howbeit not all that come out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them, hallelujah, that believe not, so we see that they could not enter in because they could not enter in because of unbelief. The word is speaking for itself. Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. Verses one and two. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reverence this. Be careful. Lest a promise that Jesus left us, where he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. Hallelujah. Be careful that none of us would seem to come short of that promise. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hallelujah. So if we're going to make it, we have to make sure we believe totally and completely in his word. Hallelujah. So the danger of unbelief is, is the danger of not believing God. Hallelujah. The danger of not trusting him a failing to take God at his word. Hallelujah. Put that in the comment section, somebody. I'm going to take God at his word. Let's read Hebrews 11 and 6, shall we? Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is 
and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what is unbelief? Unbelief is, is the equivalent of turning your back on God, saying, no, I don't believe nothing you say. My God, Hebrews 3 and 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So not believing in God is like turning your back and saying, I don't believe nothing you, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say. It's, it's, unbelief is a dangerous sin. Yeah. And it's a sin that is so deceitful. It will cheat you out of everything. Hebrews 3 and 13. But exhort one another daily. Exhort one another every day while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hallelujah. Unbelief. According to what the writer of Hebrews writes, unbelief leads to the hardness of the heart. Why? Because I don't, you don't believe him. And if you don't believe him, you're not receiving anything because you're not trusting him. And your heart is turning hard towards him. Hallelujah. But you're not receiving because you're telling God, I don't believe nothing you say. And you've turned your back on him. Hebrews 3.15. It says, while it is said, Today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. You know, one of the things that happened to the children of Israel, they were bitten by vipers and many of them were dying. And you remember when God told Moses, construct, build a brazen serpent and stick it up in the air and tell them to look at the serpent. And when they look at it, they'll be healed. Look and live. But they would not believe that they refused to look. And they died. Hallelujah. It's very dangerous to put yourself in a place where you refuse to believe God's word. Unbelief can lead to hardness of your heart. Unbelief, it grieves God. Yes. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Unbelief grieves God. Listen to what it says, Hebrews 3, 17 and 18. But with whom was he grieved? He was grieved 40 years. That 40-year journey, 40 years of circling around, the Hebrews walked in circles because of their unbelief. It grieved God. Hallelujah. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Hallelujah. It deprives us of the blessing. It deprives us. Disbelief deprives us. It steals the blessings from us. That's what verse 19 is all about. Hebrews 3 and 19. So we see, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now let's take a word, uh, a look rather at Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Hallelujah. Listen to what he says. Chapter 4 of Hebrews, verses 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So how easy is it? For people to listen to the word of God without mixing it with faith. You've got to believe. Hallelujah. We've got to believe. And how often, 
how often does the Lord look at us and say, believe? How often, hallelujah, the Lord has to say to us, trust me, have faith in me. What does, what does uh, Jesus say um, in the book of Luke chapter 8, the 25th verse? Listen to what Jesus says. And he said unto them, where is your faith? I think the Lord asks us that question over and over and over again many times. Every time we come to church, hallelujah, perhaps he's walking down the aisle saying, where's your faith? There's no reason why we should be walking in church and leaving the same way. I hear him say, where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They were in the storm, <laughs> and they were afraid. Lord, you don't even care that we perish? Jesus comes out of the bottom of the ship, stands up, and and he commands the winds and the rains and says, peace be still. And he looks back at them and says, Where's, where is your faith? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Hallelujah. Where is your faith? So, if we're not careful, saints of God, if we're not holding on like we should be holding on, we'll be drifting like a ship without a rudder. And will be in danger of having an evil heart of unbelief. The third thing, the third warning or the third take heed conversation that the writer has when he deals with the danger of being content with immaturity. Hallelujah. Being content with spiritual immaturity. I'm going to say that again. There is danger of being content with spiritual immaturity. In the word of God in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, the writer of Hebrews writes these words, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. You won't, you're not listening to the word. The Lord is trying to show you and teach you. Hallelujah. But you seem to be dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Hmm. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, and he's a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hebrews 6 and 1, the writer says, and we read it earlier, he says, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying in the foundation of the repentance uh, from dead works and of faith toward God. And we'll read it one more time in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, listen, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Here, the writer of Hebrews is simply trying to get them to grow up. Hallelujah. Come into maturity. Hallelujah. Glory. So there is a danger if we neglect, if we become disobedient. My Lord, if we become careless with this salvation, 
Hallelujah. You can be that kind of person uh, where he says you're in danger of drifting like a ship without a rudder or in danger of developing an evil heart of unbelief or you'll fall into a place where you have become content with your spiritual immaturity. And he writes and he says in chapter five that, yes, this kind of individual can be slow to learn. Hebrews 5.11. We have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Yes, and he tells them, hallelujah, some of you, we should be teachers by now. Hallelujah, but we're not taught. You haven't learned what you should have learned. Hebrews 5 and 12. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So he says, you're babies. How long are you going to stay in the baby stage? Hallelujah. That's why he writes uh, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 5, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. And Hallelujah. That person who has become content with their immaturity will lack discernment also. Verse 14, 5 and 14 of Hebrews, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So by chapter 6, he says we should be maturing by now. We should be moving on, growing in God, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith towards God. Hallelujah. So the fourth danger, the fourth danger, the writer of Hebrews, where he's saying, take heed, because if I become careless, disobedient, and neglectful of this salvation, I am in danger of backsliding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, I'll fall into that category where I fail to live a life of repentance. Serious backsliding and the failure to repent my Lord, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 10. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth with drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So it is obvious that the writer is addressing those Christians, those born-again believers, for they had been enlightened. They had tasted the heavenly gift. They had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They shared in the Holy Spirit. All of that is in verse number four. They, they, they. They tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. Hallelujah. Also in verse number five, he, he talks all about that, but these also, hallelujah, were Christians who had been leaving the faith. They had been backsliding. 
Notice verse 6 does not refer to salvation, but it refers to repentance. Verse 6, Hebrews 6 and 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So, when someone who was strong in the faith, someone who was doing all that they could do to live holy and the Lord is blessing and they decide to walk away, and they fall into sin, and they refuse to repent, that person's in danger of becoming a castaway. This is why Paul says on one occasion, I don't want to do all of this preaching and teaching and I myself be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in the race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all, in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That is, he's disqualified for service and comes under the judgment of God, then set aside. Hallelujah. And God forbid and it because the individual continues and insists on not repenting and just doing what he wants to do. Hallelujah. He, perhaps he may become sick. For this reason, many are sick. We read that scripture. In, in Corinthians all the time, examine yourself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself. First Corinthians 11 and 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Hallelujah. So there is danger if we neglect if we neglect this salvation, if we push away the things of God, hallelujah, my Lord, there is danger, there is danger. The fifth warning is the danger of committing deliberate and willful sin. Committing deliberate and willful sin. Hebrews 10 26 through 29, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden under the foot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace? This is not a sin of ignorance, but it's willfully sinning. Christians and believers that know it's wrong, but they do it anyhow. Hallelujah. This is where we are uh, if we have the state of mind where we're neglecting, when we're just being disobedient. You're in danger of going into a place where you'll be committing deliberately and willfully and doing things that are totally against the will of God. Is there forgiveness for willful sin? Yes. 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all on.
righteousness. But I say to you, if we refuse to give up our sin, if we refuse to repent, what then? What then? What will God do? Well, he will judge and discipline. He will judge and discipline us in this life. Yes? And you will be in danger of losing your reward in the next life. The danger that faces many born-again believers is not that of, of forfeiting, perhaps, or backsliding, but the danger of losing God's best, losing God's reward. Mm -hmm. The sixth danger, and I'm hastening on, is the danger of being careless and undisciplined, living carelessly and undisciplined Hallelujah. We can get spiritually slack and discouraged. Hallelujah. Yes. Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Almost done. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 17. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. My Lord, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without, which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator, or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor unto the blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. So in these passages of scripture, we see the writer is saying we can get spiritually slack and discouraged. That's what he's talking about in verse number 12. Lift the hands up of those whose hands are hanging down and those who have feeble knees. Hallelujah. And we need to to be determined to go straight ahead in our life. And this is what he's talking about in verse 13. Make straight paths for your feet. Least that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Hallelujah. And he says, be peaceable and holy. Be peaceable and holy. Holy. That's verse 14. Follow peace with all men, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He says that we should not become bitter and resentful. That's verse 15. Mm -hmm. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And verses 16 and 17 tell us that if we go on like this, failing and falling, failing and falling in a careless, undisciplined way, chastening and loss, hallelujah, we will have to endure chastening and now and loss at the judgment seat will follow. Mm -hmm. That's another lesson. I need to go there. And the seventh warning, the danger of refusing to hear the word of God. The word is coming, but you refuse to hear it. You refuse to absorb it. You refuse. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 26 Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 26. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice 
that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, uh -huh, and to God rather, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Hallelujah. Don't shut down on the word. See that you don't refuse him that speaks the word. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shall not, I shake not rather the earth only, but also heaven. So God has spoken in two ways. The writer of Hebrews says, First he spoke to Moses. This was the voice from Sinai. Those are the verses we read 18 through 21 in this 12th chapter. Second time, he said, he speaks to us now. He's speaking to us now. Hallelujah. Through his word, through his servants, he speaks to us now. And the danger is shown in the first part of verse 25. Hallelujah. In the first part of verse 25, where the writer says these words, he says, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Hallelujah. So, as a man of God, I have to poise the question, are you and I at any time refusing to hear the voice of God and to do his will? If that is true, then we are in danger. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, beware, caution, take heed. Hallelujah. The Lord is still speaking. Are we refusing to hear his voice and to do his will? So these are some dangers we are warned about and which we as born-again believers face. Take heed. Hallelujah. Take heed to them. Hallelujah. They will make for progress. If we take heed, we'll, we'll progress. We'll mature. Will develop in the area of sanctification and usefulness, but to ignore these warnings, hallelujah, will lead us to a place of failure and falling and fruitlessness. And this will bring God's chastening among us. Hallelujah. And when Jesus comes, instead of standing before him blameless, there will be shame and loss. I want everything God has planned everything God has provided. Yes. And everything God has promised. I want everything. I don't want to lose anything that God has in store for me. I'm going to close out with this, this verse found in first John chapter two, verse number 28. John writes these words. And now little children, Abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take heed that everything that we've been told in his word, that we should give the most earnest heed to the things we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. Father, I love you and I thank you for your word. Your word is rich. 
Your word strengthens. It corrects us. Hallelujah. Help us, Father, to be all that we should be. Forgive us all of our sins. If there's anything in us that should not be, take it away. Create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us. Blot out our transgressions and restore unto us the joy of thy salvation. Help us, Father. Help us, O God. Help us, Lord, that we'll be able to receive everything you've planned, everything you've purposed, and everything you have provided for us. To trust your promises, to hold true to your word, even in the midst of trial and tribulation, that we will receive all that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. My Lord, I thank God for his word. If you want to be baptized into that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, send us a request, won't you? Admin at grtdc.org. And someone from the staff will reach out to you. Yes, we'll make sure that you're baptized into that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. If you don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost, reach out to us. You want to be saved. You want to be born again. Admin at grtdc.org. And someone will reach out to you. Hallelujah. You want to plant a seed in this ministry? You may do so. The technician will put that information on the screen for you. Want to pay your tithe or give into the ministry? Plant your seed. Those of you who are at Refuge Temple Annex, you may use Givelify or Mother Van or... Uh, Elder Blackwood can pass the basket. You may plant your seed. Those of you at Jeremiah Temple there uh, in Baltimore, hold your seed until Thursday and we'll plant together. Father, bless everyone who's planting seed, who's giving into the ministry. Bless them. Pour out the blessings in their life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've kept you long enough. I thank God for all of you. And prayerfully, the Lord will allow us to come together again on next week. But in between now and then, three things I need you to do. Be careful, be prayerful, and be holy. Shalom, shalom.